Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. Hebrews chapter 12. Wherefore, well, we just spoke about all that faith. Chapter 11. Seeing we, Hebrews, also are compressed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Not figurative. You're, there's not a whole bunch of people around you. And yet cloud is used here and Jesus says, I shall come with the clouds. The rapture, we shall meet in the clouds. So something of clouds in the gathering of the saints. Uh, some people say that in heaven they can see what's going on. I, I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know why people in heaven would want to look at this miserable, sin cursed world. But the witnesses were in chapter 11 the people that we just read about. If they had faith and they overcame their problems and their sufferings, so can you. Let us lay aside every weight. When you're running a race, take off everything that you don't need. Because it's only going to weigh you down. And the sin which, do, which does so easily beset us. Get rid of that sin. That sin that you love. That you care for. That you give excuse to God for. And all sins. But that one sin that we all have. So the writer of Hebrews says to the Hebrews. You know what? We do have that one sin. But we read earlier. You know. If you, if you sin willfully, you lost it. In the Old Testament, when you did sin, and you, there were sins that there was no forgiveness. Excuse me. But under Jesus Christ, under the blood, under the gospel, a man can sin, and he can plead the blood of Jesus Christ if he seriously repents of it. And let us run with patience. So see, it's a race. Now go back to 1036. Chapter 10, verse 36. For ye have need of patience. So patience is widely spoken about. And for the Jew Jews, we saw the patience of Joel. Tribulation period. But I think Hebrews 12 is speaking to a Hebrew that is saved right now, presently, and those who are saved now. I don't think we're looking at the tribulation period. And you know, just put your sins under the blood of Jesus Christ and run. As Paul said, I have finished my course. I'm not saying Paul wrote Hebrews. I don't know. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, Titus 2.13. I will say that Hebrews 12, what we've read so far, is written to a Christian, a Christian Hebrew. It's the thing that matches what Paul has said. Jesus is the author. Not money, fame, riches, whatever. Jesus is the author. Not the high priest, not the sacrifices. Author and finisher of our faith. From start to finish. And when he died on that cross, he said, it is finished. He offered for us by the gospel. He died for our sins, according to scripture. That's the author. 
He was buried. And he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's what signs us as Christians. Who Jesus for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down the right hand of the throne of God. He did it for joy. The suffering, the pain, the sorrow, the being nailed, because he knew what God would give him, a bride. Jacob worked seven years and seven more years for his Rachel. All that hard work, and you know the character of Laban, man, and you know, he changed his wages ten different times. He probably overworked Jacob. But when he finally got his bride, and he could call her her own, would have been joy. And for Jesus Christ, for his bride, all that he has done for her, one day will be called away. It will be joined with him for all eternity. For consider him, Jesus, that endured such contradiction. Now the contradiction is sinners cannot save themselves. Nor did Jesus need to be saved. So what Jesus did on the cross, he did what sinners cannot do. And he did something that he did not need to do for himself. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself that's Jesus Christ and we read that in Isaiah 53 against himself his iniquities was upon us wait a minute what did he do he was beaten he was he was chastised he was nailed he was put on with the thorns upon his head but what did he do absolutely nothing it should have been me as a sinner it should be all sinners that get the wrath of God not just to say all of them, but for the contradiction that Jesus did that for us. Who else would step in and do that? Least you be wearied and faint in your mind. Remember, it's about Jesus. It's not about us. What's the subject? Hebrews 11. They kept their eyes on the Lord. And they sinned. But they got right with God and they kept their eyes back on God. The illustration of the people in Hebrews 11. They can do it, we can do it. They sinned, we sinned. And those people that are written in Hebrews, they are in heaven. They rose from the grave when Jesus died. So they were not completely rejected. They were not, you know, lost when their sins. Ye have not yet res re uh, resisted unto the blood. The beating, the whipping, the injury that caused Jesus. Striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Alright, God does chasing. Now, I'm going to show you why I believe Hebrews 12 is written to save Hebrews, save Christians save Jewish people or as we went through 11 chapters and we say you know tribulation we said the Jews that would not receive Christ 12 is different we'll see why now the Bible in the book of Proverbs and Eli the high priest God teaches fathers are to chastise their children when they go wrong that is a Bible teaching I don't care what child and families or whatever your plan in your organization in your state is if you go against a parents that love their children and spank their children I'm, I'm talking about according to the Bible I'm not talking about excessive I'm talking about something you know you spank your children because you want them to do right you've not done it excessively it is something that should be done in private not openly and if you give the parents a hard time, God's going to give you a hard time. But the Bible speaks of chastisement. Now watch. Don't forget the example of chastisement. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. 
Now look how he says children and son. We'll get in that in a minute. Nor faint when thou art rebuked of him, God. Proverbs 24.10, Ephesians 3.13. Listen, if God is, is chastising you because you are doing something you're not supposed to, don't faint of it. You think God's going to brutally beat you? No. We're going to see the love of God in a minute. He's trying to do it to help you. Most children who are going to be chastised, they will overreact. And Proverbs even gives us a verse. Spare not for their crying. That child knows distinctly. As soon as you say, get in that room or get me whatever, however you start off that punishment. Then comes the tears and, and I would say, what, what are you crying for? I haven't done nothing yet. Faint not. For whom the Lord loveth. He chastened it. Now there it is. Whom the Lord loveth. Let's go on a little bit more so we can get context and go back. To, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now look at that. The Bible told us, Paul tells us, when you receive Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit seals you. He comes into you. Christ says he becomes your comforter. You become a, a child of God calling upon God, Abba, Father. A saved Christian by the testimony and the merits of the finished work of Calvary and the empty tomb. He is in chapter 12. He is calling these children Hebrews. They are saved Christians. They are not the son of Abraham. Chapter 12, they are the son of God. And that's the same thing for me. They have moved their family from Abraham and stepped up to a better family, God. But John 8, 44, Jesus talking to Jews said, you are of your father, Satan. All men that are born are born of sin and born of the flesh. They are born of Satan. You may fell in the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but your family is through Satan. And this age called the church age, you need to be born again away from Satan to God. And these Hebrews in chapter 12 have been. There was no birth, new birth in Hebrews 11. None of these people had a new birth. So in chapter 12, you see, despite what's going on in Hebrews 11, the Old Testament saints that you've heard about, you know their story. We have a better salvation. We have a better relationship with God than, as far as the Hebrews, as your fathers. And as your father, if you do wrong, you will receive correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he chases and scorneth every son whom he receiveth. This is correction of a father and son. That personal relationship. Now that promise was given to Solomon. God told David, if your son goes against my word, that son will not obey me. You can't find that anywhere else in the Old Testament scriptures. I will chasten him. And Solomon becomes a type of child of God through Jesus Christ. And he does. He goes out and worships other gods and marries women that he's not supposed to. And does everything as a king that God told him not to do. And yet, he will be in heaven because he's got that sure mercies as David had it. So look to Solomon. Solomon committed sacrilege. He worshipped and made idols and images and altars. He will be in heaven. And yet there's a teaching today that we've already read. You know, if you commit this sin, you're not saved. Funky. You realize the, there are laws, adoption. You can disinherit your natural born child, but you cannot disinherit an adopted child. For the Lord, who, whom he, for whom the Lord loveth, he chases and scorneth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, endure. You don't have to. If 
God can punish you as your as his child and say, you know what? And you can say, God, that's it. I, I, I'm rebelling against you. I'm not going to listen. You do that again, and I'm, you're still his child. You're just a dishonorable child. You're a rebellious child. You're still his child. You just won't listen to your father. If you endure chasing, God deal it with you as with son. All right. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it with truly, truly repenting. God says, you're my son. I've got to punish you. And then when it's done, he puts his arms around you. He tells you he loves you. And he, let's try better next time. But I had to punish you. I had to punish you. I had to. For what son is he whom the father chases not? That child is... Go back and read Proverbs. This child may cause his mother shame. This child is a fool to his father. This child is causing problems to his mother. This child is wicked. This child is evil. Just reading a note here. Some of our troubles are because the father is treating us like a son. Yes. Some of your troubles in your life will be because of God. And one of them because he may be chastising you for your sin. So when you get troubles and problems, one of the things can be said, God, is this because of my sin? If it is, he'll answer you. A father has to answer the child. In the law of America, a person who is being charged with a crime must be told what the crime is. So if you sincerely say, God, what are you doing this for? God has to answer if it's your sin. If God is doing it because you're, God has to answer you. You Sometimes we don't want to hear that answer. Sometimes we look for option number two, box number three, or look under the covers and see if there's something else. God will answer. Will we take that answer? That's the problem. As with sons, for what son is he whom the father chaseth not? A disobedient child. A child that will not listen. In the authority of the father. Hey, when that son left and went to live in the pigsty, his father couldn't chase him no more. He left. He made his own problem. He made his own conditions. In order to get right, he had to come back to the father. And he had already repented and got right. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Revelation 3.19 Romans 8.13 1 Corinthians 11.30 God is not going to punish. Get that. Let me say first. Before I tell you what about God. If I'm in a store and there's a child that's acting up in that store, whatever thing, and I go and I pull down his britches and I punish that child in aisle number whatever, and if that child is not mine, I have the right to be arrested by the parents and the child. So God is not going to punish Satan's children. If you are not a child of God, don't you blame your life on God. He has nothing to do with it. You're not his son. You're Satan's son, John 8, 44. And Satan ain't going to punish you. We just read that. Whom the father chastised not. All right. What father would not chastise his children? Satan. He don't care. As far as his children goes, they are going to hell. He don't care. He wants the company. And so you are bastards. You are a child born on a wedlock. The old birth. And not sons. So all people are not going to heaven when all has end. Not everybody is a child of God. It says right there. And are not sons. Furthermore. We have had fathers of our flesh, that's your dad, 
that's your human father, which corrected us. That's not fool. That's not true today. There are many children today that do not know who their fathers are and are not being corrected. And look what they're doing all over the world. I guarantee a Muslim father is not chastising his son. And if he is, he's not doing it for good. And we gave them reverence. That's not happening today. There's one thing when you had a father and he corrected you. You watch what you did around him, and if you did anything wrong, you make sure you peeked around the corner. You make sure there was no way for him to know. I did that. When I smoked cigarettes when I was in high school, I made sure I was going around, and my father's boss would come by right where we were every morning. And one morning he was late. Yeah, the guy was on. The guy was timely. He was late. I thought, oh, give me that cigarette, lit it up. I was sitting there talking on well, I didn't know was he came by late. And when he got to work, he pulled my father aside. He said, you know what? I care about you. I care about your children. I want you to know that I saw your son today smoking. <laughs> you know why I hid? You know why I waited for my father's boss to drive by? Because I didn't want my father to know. And we need to realize Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of our Father, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, behold the evil and the good. You can't hide from God like you can do from your Father. There are many ways I wonder how my mom found out what I was doing wrong. I know some of them today. I don't know all of them. But I did things in secret because I did not want my parents to know because I did not want to be chastised. But they're chastising me as a child. I grew up with a conscience. And my parents fed my conscience and grew my conscience. So when I did something, I looked around the corner. And times I felt guilty and I read undid what I had done wrong. Thank God for parents like that. We had parents tonight, we were passing out gospel tracts, they were saying, Tell, tell the young lady thank you. Tell the young lady thank you. And thank God for parents like that. Raising their children right. Trying to. Corrected us. And we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father, capital F, of spirits and live? Listen. You reverence your father when he spanks you. Why can't you reverence God when he spanks you? Both of them doing it for the good. They love you. For verily, for a few days, chastise us after their own pleasure. Sometimes you were punished by your parents because you put them in a spot. You made them look bad. You put on a show that, you know what? People are going to talk about your parents. So, Maybe your father had other modes for some punishments or other punishments. I'm not forgetting my family, but there was there were things there with, with the punishments in, in my life. But he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, whatever reason your mom and dad pun, punished you, let's say if it wasn't the right reasons. Let's say they weren't even Christians. They didn't care. All right. Maybe because they were they were drunk on drugs or something. I don't know. But God did it for my profit. God does it so that we may be holy. And God said, "Be holy, for I am holy." And one of those things for you to be holy is I caught you doing that. Bend over. And in Hebrews chapter 12, what we're seeing, what we've seen through 11 chapters is the nation of Israel is about to bend over pretty soon. I don't know when. Their father, God, is going to take them, he's going to pull their parents down, and he's going to spank their rear ends, and it's called the time of Jacob, you're in trouble. And I'm telling you right now, that's a chastisement that is really harsh. But look at what those Jews have done since Exodus. 
They have not listened to God. They have not properly done what God has told. They've gone after idols. They've gone after everything. And God said, okay, fine. You wait till I remove that church out of there, and I'm going to get you with seven years. I'm going to chastise you, and I'm going to use Satan the rod. Uh, Psalms 23. Thy rod and thy staff, that's Satan. That's the same rod that speaks about in Proverbs. Why is God doing Jacob's trouble? Because he loves them. And he wants them to get right. And he wants to know their true heart. Now, no chastising for the present seems to be joyous. Come on. You just got whipped. Or whatever. You, belt, rod, whatever it is. It is not joyful. It's not. Okay, what you think? But grievous. Oh, it hurts. It's supposed to hurt. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Makes you want to do right. As far as the Hebrews in the tribulation period, that fruit will be they're going to run. And they're going to wait for the Messiah. They're going to wait for God as they waited when Moses came to pull them out of Egypt. And the fruit would be they get the land, the millennial inheritance. For the Christian is, you know what? The fruits of the Spirit. You're more cautious next time. Wherefore, lift up your hands, which hang down. <laughs> oh, oh, you're rubbing your hiney. And the feeble knees. Get down, boy. It's also, you know, you, you're just worn out. You've been whipped. That's what Jacob's trouble is going to do, man. You're just going to be all. Oh, going to be no joy. Read the book of Revelation and, and Daniel and everything. There's going to be no joy. There's going to be no hope. But there is hope. Verse 2. For the Jews in tribulation, Jesus is the offer and finisher of their salvation. Make straight paths for your feet. Least that which is lame be turned out away, but let it rather be healed. This is works. This is a tribulation text. So Hebrews 12, we're still really in a tribulation. But it does have Christian principles. Because in a tribulation, you need must to believe on Jesus Christ. And the works. I guarantee Satan is going to mess up the tribulation period. I, I, this is what I think. I think. I think in the tribulation period he's going to teach you need to believe on Christ alone. No works at all. That's not the case. you got to believe on Christ. And there is a temple. There is a temple worship. Follow peace with all men. And holiness. Find someone who's living right, follow him. And be holy. What's one of the things of being holy? Verse 10. You gotta be chastised. You gotta go through Jacob's trouble. He that endures to the end. Oh, look, there you go. See? That's tribulation. Without which no man shall see the Lord. Now that's I like to turn to Dr. Ruckman's uh, book on Hebrews, uh, his commentary, and read of what he has to say. On page 309, give him the credit about, and people say, man, without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness without which no man has seen the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5 8. Look them unto, uh, excuse me, unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. Hebrews 9 28. He that doeth evil has not seen God. 3 John 11. Last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Matthew 24, 30. Gather me, saints, together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Psalms 50, verse 5. God be merciful to on us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Psalm 66, 67, 1. 
The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Look at, upon them has the light shine. Isaiah 9 2. Thou that dwellest between the cherubim, shine forth. So, tribulation passage. There'll be men that do not see the Lord. And there'll be men that will see the Lord. And all the world's going to see the Lord. Something about the tribulation period that there is a rapture. There is a, a, a view of Jesus Christ in the midst of the tribulation period. And those Jews that are doing right, they're going to see the Lord. The world won't. Like the church rapture. The world is not going to see Jesus. But we will. Now I don't know if the world's going to see us go. I don't know the dead in Christ. I don't know if it's going to stir up the cemeteries. I have no idea. But I do know one thing. When the rapture happens, I will see Jesus. A person that has rejected Jesus Christ will remain on this planet and will not see Jesus. But as a great white throne judgment, he will see Jesus. Looking. It just said, which no man shall see the Lord looking. <laughs> but how's that? Looking diligently, at least any man fall of the grace of God. Least any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So the trouble, Genesis 26, 34. The bitterness. Yeah, I got a note here. All right, we'll come back with the bitterness real quick. Now, let's get an example of what verse 15 means. Least there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. That's the brother of Jacob. Who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Esau was the firstborn. Again, we're talking to Jews. They would know this story. For ye know how that afterwards, see, ye know how, you know about this, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance. Well, there's trouble. It shows right there. He, he's lost. He did not repent, though he sought it carefully with tears. Cry all you want. Oh, as I said, this for the Lord Jesus, forgive me. If you don't believe, you're not saved. Now, look at diligently, least any man fall of the grace of God. Esau fell. The grace was there for him. He was the firstborn of Isaac. It was to be Abraham, Isaac, Esau. It would not be Hebrews. If Esau did right, this book would be titled Edomites, not Hebrews. But he sold it for beans, lentils. Jacob obtained it. And no, he did not do it haphazard. No, he didn't do it swindling. Esau came to Jacob and said, hey, give me some food. Well, give me your birthright. We don't care about that. I'm hungry. I'm going to die. Right here. And he sold it. He sold it. He didn't care. Least any root of bitterness. Well, what's the bitterness? Esau wanted to kill Jacob after his father had the meal. Esau, you forgot. You're the one that caused that. You sold it rightfully. And then when the children of Israel are going through the wilderness, heading to the promised land, Moses goes to the Moabites and says, Hey, listen, let us come through. We'll pay for our water. We'll stay in the king's highway. And Esau said, You know you're not here. I mean, yeah, Esau said, Here, we're not going to let you through, Edomites. Then Obadiah tells us about Esau. When King Nebuchadnezzar came in to destroy Judah, some of the Jews ran everywhere they could. They ran to Egypt. They ran far away. Those that were not caught by the Nebuchadnezzar army, 
Some of them ran into Edom, and Edom caught them and turned them over and sold them over to uh, Nebuchadnezzar's army. And then they went in and, and uh, uh, spoiled the cities. That is the bitterness of Esau. And that bitterness went unto his children, it went to his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and his great-great-grandchildren. Esau became an enemy of Israel. Bitterness. Spring up that troubled you. And thereby many be defiled. All Esau's children were defiled because of that bitterness. Don't let one person, don't let the Antichrist bring in you bitterness because you'll be in trouble. And whatever you do, don't sell out. Esau sold out for food. What's going to be one of the main number one troubles in Jacob's trouble? In order to buy food, you've got to receive that mark. You better not sell out. So again, we see tribulation passage. Don't sell out as a Christian. Many are selling out today. Don't sell out. It ain't worth it. Now, you won't lose your soul, but you won't get no crowns reward. And look at the story we get here about Esau. He teared. He cried. Remember Proverbs? If your child cries, spare not the rod. He's fake crying. He didn't care. Again, Obadiah speaks about the Edomites. And I had another note here, I thought. Oh, they did. Oh. All right, move on. I wrote another note. For ye, Hebrews, are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. This is the Exodus 19 and 20. This is their fathers in, in, in coming out of Egypt when they came to Mount Sinai. That mountain became a, a holy volcano with no lava. He says, you weren't there. Your father's word, but you weren't there. And the sound of the trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard, entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Again, this would be a Jewish story of the book of Moses that they would know about. This is where God spoke to them. <coughs> Excuse me. This is where the Ten Commandments were given orally before they were written down. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. See how the law? And the law wasn't even there yet. If, if one of your sheep went on that mountain, you got to kill him. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So what we read in Exodus 19, Exodus 20, God speaking to the people. They told Moses, Moses, you speak for us. We fear God. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. Notice the New Testament, it's an S. Zion with an S is heavenly. Zion with a Z is the earthly Zion. And unto the city of the living God. Now there's a city spoken about. We won't go there. Psalm 48 verse 50. But let's look at Hebrews 11.40. While well, we're here. Hebrews 11.40. About the better things. God has provided some better thing for us. That they without should not be made perfect. Oh well, here's a better city. 11.10, Hebrews 11.10. Now, I don't know about this one. 11.10 is about Abraham. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, is this it? I don't know. Hebrews 11.16. Hebrews 11.16. But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. 
for he has prepared for them a city. So we read, but ye are come to Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, a heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable company of angels. New Jerusalem? This is where God is not going to be ashamed to call them his people. Well, there's Jews today. God's ashamed of them, so this is not today. This is off in eternity. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, Lamb's book of life, and the books were open, Revelation 20, and to God the judge of all, Abraham says, I'm not the judge of all the earth, do right. Knows the capital J. Jesus Christ is the judge. And to the spirits of just man made perfect. This is off in the eternity. This is after the church has been judged. This is after the Jews of tribulation have gone into eternity. And perfect. That would be 100%. Spirit. And to Jesus, the mediator, as Paul told Timothy, of the new covenant, all right, not of man, the mediator of the new covenant, New Testament, the gospel, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now that blood is the Acts 20:28. 20, God's blood. Now look at Hebrews 11.4. Notice how we keep going back to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11.4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gift, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh now remember in genesis god told cain your blood is your brother's blood speaketh abel's blood says i've been killed vengeance jesus blood speaks better than abel says i am the lamb of god i can cleanse you of all your sins so when you go out and present the gospel to people you are speaking about the blood that's much better than the blood of Abel. You are speaking about God's blood that saves. And if you don't have a Jesus that did not give blood, he's not speaking. See, that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Verse 24, Jesus. For if they escape not, who refused him that spake on earth, where Jesus Christ was, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that sprinkleth from heaven. Christ is seated at the right hand of the throne. Christ was here on this earth as God and as man. He is seated in heaven as God, speaking, going all the world and preach the gospel. Those Jews had the earthly ministry of God the Son, God the God, God the man. You rejected that. You better not reject God from heaven. This is your last chance. Whose voice then shook the earth, but not he that has promised, saying yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. He's coming. And by the way, we're learning about this voice here, 25 and 26. Not the earth only. That's That was God, Jehovah, in Exodus 19 and 20. God, Jesus Christ, Jehovah, is going to shake the earth and the heaven. How's that? Your fathers, you just saw the earthquake. You will see the earth and the heaven shake. You saw a God that loved you and gave you his commandments and his laws. 
you're going to see a God come back as a lion destroying the wicked. I don't think anybody died in the next 19 and 20 of Exodus. You wait till he comes in the earth and the heavens are shaken. When the voice of his mouth, the sword of the spirit comes out of his mouth. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken. Heaven and earth shall flee away as of things that are made, and that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. He can shake me. You ain't going to shake the word of God. You ain't going to shake the Jews that believe Jesus when he comes in the second advent. Wherefore we receive a kingdom uh, which cannot be removed. That's got to be the heavenly kingdom. Because if it's the millennial kingdom on the earth, the earth is going to go bye-bye. The heavens are going to go bye-bye. So this is a better kingdom. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Fear God. For our God is a consuming fire. And what's Peter tell us about the earth and the heavens are going to happen to them? Fire. What does Revelation 20 say about those who eternity in their life has rejected God? Fire. Fire cleanses. it. God will cleanse his church. God will cleanse his people by fire of everything that's against them and him. Fire will be the ultimate judgment for all eternity.